this conversation. I'm so grateful to all of you ladies for just allowing yourselves to jump into that space of vulnerability. You know, I, I can imagine everybody here is feeling super triggered. In the words of Asata Shakur, people get used to anything. The less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. And after a while, people just get people just think that oppression is a normal state of things. But to become free, you have to become acutely aware of being a slave. I, these were words that she acted in the context of being, you know, a Black Panther activist in the civil rights movement. But I think they're so true because if if nothing else, what these stories that you have just shared have confirmed or have actually shown is that racism and sexism and the oppression at the intersection of those two barriers are daily experiences that we have to live with as black women in South Africa, but also in the legal profession. Um, I think stats show that we only make up as women of color, 17% of all the people in the legal profession in South Africa um, and only 44% of the people in the legal profession are actually black. And there are so many barriers, like, for example, going to the bar where you have to do a whole year of unpaid leave, for example, um, of, of unpaid work, for example, uh, um, things like access to law schools, access to education, access to fees. And there's so many barriers that stop us from being able to enter these places, which is exactly why the demographics of our country are not reflected in the legal profession, you know? And I want us to delve in some of the ways in which we are able to participate in transforming the legal profession. And I want to ask Tando, you know, you, you are, you are an activist in your everyday life. You're always speaking out about against great injustices, but at the same time, there are so many limitations in the law as it exists. And what are some of the ways that you live your politics um, in the legal space? but also just pragmatically as somebody who's very appalled by the state of affairs, how do I get involved in then saying, you know what, enough, I want to see the legal profession being transformed? Well, I think, you know, we need to start at the beginning. And for me, the beginning is naming the demon, calling yeah. the demon by its name as the first step to destroying it. And for me, in fact, it's not even about me, but th these are the facts. The fact is that our society is really struggling with something called white heteropatriarchy. And exactly. if you look at all colonized societies, societies that are um, survivors of colonization, you'll see that um, the patterns and the pathologies of oppression and how those oppressions have uh, you know manifested in, in these diverse symptoms are very much similar. So for me, I mean, for anyone who, who perhaps doesn't know what white heteropatriarchy is, white heteropatriarchy is an intersectional system of diverse oppressions that oppress people solely on the premise, uh, so, solely on the premise of their race, their sex, their gender their sexual orientation, their ability, as well as their socioeconomic class. Mm -hmm. And white heteropatriarchy, as the name you know, suggests, uh, works in favor for your white, able-bodied, elitist, um, you know, cisgendered and heterosexual human beings. You know? so, so our societies have been under the spell of white fatherhood for hundreds of years. And I think the mistake that people make is thinking that we were colonized by accident. You know, I remember having a debate with someone close to me who was saying that, oh no, like a Dutch people happened across South Africa because <laughs> they knew X, Y, Z. And it's like, no, actually it was a very well constructed system. I mean, it was very sophisticated and very well thought out. And psychology is at the core, which is what we see today. We break people down little by little. We understand mm. the significance of education. They, they understood the significance of linguistic liberation. And if you look at our, our community's language and education are, are two of, or one of, or two of the core things that have been dismembered 
and and has been at the core of of dismantling our own identity, our own um, history, and our own existence. You know, even if you look at slavery, where a person was not even allowed, like if a person touched a book, they were lynched, you know. Yeah. So here in South Africa, with how Black people had a compromised educational system. But I think if we look at my, my scenario, I spoke about colored people as, as also being complicit in oppression. And the reason why that is, and not just colored people, but people of Indian descent as well, is because um, this white heteropatriarchy, because it was a psychological mechanism, said that we are going to make sure that even amongst people of color, and even amongst people who are black themselves, we are going to dismember unity so that there is division even amongst themselves. So they preoccupy themselves with who's Zulu, who's Venda, who's colored, who's black, before they even get to white people, you know, before they actually even get to the system of oppression. So for me, um, the starting point of this discourse is saying that we are where we are because of white heteropatriarchy and that the system that kills, that, that, that puts its knee on someone's neck, the system that puts its knee on a black man's neck in America is the same system that lynches an eight month old pregnant woman, is the same system that thinks that it's okay for us to work for an entire year um, to become advocates without pay or without adequate remuneration, is the same system that says that our black hair in its natural state is untidy and disgusting, and is the same system that separates us even as black people. And yeah. you know, I, I cannot then go without mentioning my own experience in, in law, where I was headhunted by the biggest law firm in the country. I mean, I, I had just finished my second year, and here I was being headhunted as one of the top you know, legal students, you know, in, in, yeah. in the top law schools in the country. And only to be humbled by a black woman who was an agent of whiteness, who came up with the whole story about how I didn't want to be there. And so then I needed to leave and I was traumatized, you know. So yeah. I think that, that's the beginning point. When, when we start there, then we can really start unpacking things because then we can also see black people as being agents of whiteness as well. And why yeah. we've got Uncle Toms and why we've got pygmies, you know, who, are, who, who favor patriarchy and Uncle Toms who favor whiteness. So, you know, um, just going back to, 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 to how I think um, transformation kind of begins. It begins for me by, number one, having that education, um, not, only in the, not only in our schools, in basic education and higher education, but also integrating that profession in, in law, in, 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 in law school, as well as in um, uh, legal training and also after legal training. For yeah. me, the reason why whiteness and why patriarchy has been so comfortable is because we haven't disrupted it. Instead, what we've been doing is that we've been playing the game. I'll give you an example, I, and I really want people to think about this. Think about the fact that we say that justice in South Africa is delayed because of the high amount of cases and the few amount of judges on the bench. And I mean, the amount of charges on the bench is not a predetermined number. That number could easily be increased if we enabled that. But yeah. remember the judiciary and that white heteropatriarchy planted itself in the economy, in our law, in our land, in our institutions, in our businesses, everywhere. And so even our judiciary and the legal profession is, is very elitist. And so we've got people that put their noses up in the air to say, you must work for 25 years or 35 years before you can ever be able to be a judge, which for me is very ridiculous, you know, and especially because I used to be a researcher working at the Supreme Court of Appeal. You know, you know, Sedimo, you know these things. So yeah. I, I'm of the view that if we, if we were intentional in undoing the elitism that comes with white fatherhood, you know, by saying, no, let's open up the judiciary, I, I, Tando Kumete, who's been studying for 10 years, who's been at law school for five years, who's doing her master's, who's, who's worked in re different research organizations, who's worked on the ground with different organizations, who's worked with activist organizations, should be eligible to go to a school designed for judges to be trained so that I can be trained there, 
Why am I spending 25 years working as a lawyer so I can become a judge? When the, when the two functions of, of, of these professions are vastly different. When, when you really look at it, um, being a judge requires you to be someone who is um, an academic of sorts, mm. someone who philosophizes, someone who's very good at analysis and interpretation. And, and it, I mean, if you look at like Dicey, Lord Dicey, I know I'm looking at a white man, but if you look at Lord Dicey's work, um, and, and, and you know, that's a lot of where our law is premised. It was very philosophical, you know, Aristotle and Plato, they were very philosophical in how they saw the law and how they took it and kind of um, reworked it in their minds to make sense, you know, in the, in the world around us. And yet we're training someone, we're training people to be something that they ultimately are not going to be, you know. So for me, I can, I can say that um, the, the, the judiciary itself and just the legal profession itself is very elitist. And what we do, because we're so brainwashed and because we think elitism is a nice thing because it separates and divides us, we will continue to have um, justice delayed, which for me is an insult, especially as someone who works with gender-based violence. I can't afford to have someone who wants to wait for 20 years to become a judge when we need more judges now on the bench to take yeah. up the, the backlog of cases. So especially if we continue participating in the red race of elitism, which, which actually comes from or is underpinned by um, white heteropatriarchy. We are not going to see transformation for ourselves and we're also not going to see transformation for, for society at large because justice will always be delayed because justice is being exercised only by a select few. I hear you. I think that's such an important point to challenge the status quo because when we are quiet, we are endorsing the status quo and the status quo is anti-black, anti-woman at the moment. So to keep quiet is to participate in the continuation of our own oppression. And also when we apply our minds, because a lot of the time we just accept things as they are, We're like, well, you, I need to wait 25 years to get to the bench, but who made up those laws? Who designed the system to be in that way? And just challenging that and challenging yourself to be asking critical questions all the time is actually so important. Um, the next question, I mean, I want to go back to Holofelo. She, I mean, wow, she had such a traumatic experience in corporate, um, just calling out and having to actually interact um, with whiteness. And maybe even Mpo can chip in here because you managed to rise up to the top of the top at, you know, a corporate white law firm, essentially. And I mean, in, in, in these quote unquote workspaces and safe spaces that we create for ourselves, we always talk about call out culture and cancel culture. And essentially the gist of it is that um, we've been trained to just, I mean, on social media, I can go like hashtag drag somebody and whatever, and just ruin somebody's reputation or cancel somebody. If I feel like they don't serve me in a particular way, because I'm protecting myself, I'm protecting my inner peace or whatever the case may be. But if you're in a corporate setting and you actually need this person to somewhat like you because your livelihood, which is your job, which is your career trajectory, is dependent on you having successful interactions with people who seem like they're out to literally um, dehumanize you. What are some of the ways that you then, in, in your personal, so we're not even talking about systemic destruction, we're talking about when you are facing personal racism or sexism or intersectional oppression, how, what are some of the constructive ways of being able to call out this behavior, being able to root it out at, you know, at the roots and creating safer spaces for those who come after you? I'll start with Holofelo, but Mpo, please um, jump in as well. Okay, I'll tell you how I handled it and how I would handle it. Had, it will never happen because I will not allow it to happen. <laughs> Yeah. I've learned so much from that experience. But what I did was call it out. Tando's right. You call out the demon for what it is. I called it out. I said, I feel like you are working me out because I am black. And how is it that I am the, the most senior black in a law firm that's been around since the 80s? How am yeah. I the most senior black 
when I am a first year associate. And I told, I, I said, this is embarrassing. We are in, <laughs> we're in Africa, we're in South Africa. There is no representation. And um, yeah, so you have to call it out. At, and they, you know what? People who have, who have created the system are so intimidated by people who, who do call it out. They don't want you and that's why they work you out. Yeah. So you have to call it out, make, make it shake, make it uncomfortable. And you don't have to cause drama or anything like that, but you do have to make it shake, make it uncomfortable so that that, situ- that environment is not a safe space for racists. They, yeah. must, they must be just as uncomfortable to implement racial policies. Mm. And yeah, that, that, is my, that is how you should deal with it besides, besides leaving that kind of environment. Because yeah. it's a big, it's a bigger demon that you can't. I used to fight it, and you 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 really won't win, especially when you're not at the table. You have to have a seat at the table, and I don't mean named partner, junior partner. I mean you have to have like equity. You have to be in there to really fight it, and even then, it's still a little difficult. But rather that than fighting it from the bottom, they will choose a partner over you anytime. Yeah. A partner can slap you and throw you down the stairs. That's their partner. If you don't find it comfortable, you need to leave the firm. So you, need, you also need to look at your career trajectory where you're trying to be. Not every law firm is like that. Not every team is like that. You have to, that's a, that's a, that's a time where you realign your goals, where you shift your thinking and you see where you want to be in life. If you still want to be in, let's say you're in litigation and you still want to stay in that space, then find um, a better environment Got it. That, align, that aligns with your values and no racism. Yo, I hear you. And maybe you can touch on this, but I think sometimes it's so difficult. Jobs are hard in South Africa. We have literally people who are qualified, people who have degrees, yeah. people who have good grades, not being able to enter into certain spaces. So when I have to pick between I'm going to get a job and just be able to put food on the table and, you know, black tax and maintain my family and so forth, and calling out a white man at the risk of losing this job that's allowing me to be able to take care of my family, maybe I'm just going to keep quiet. And in that way, I'm perpetuating the cycle. So how have you managed to navigate some of those intricacies in, in your own life? You make a very valid point, um, Sia, and it's, it's so true that, um, you know, as much as we want to speak out, as much as we want to be activists, um, sometimes you look at, at, you know, this is my, my only job. Um, you know, if I, if I raise my voice, if I do something, what's going to become of me? And it's, it's reminiscent of some of the experiences that I've gone through as well. Um, so I was very fortunate to go into an all BEE team when I went to do my articles and, um, I went to the law firm that I went to and much like, uh, Tando's experience, I remember very well the person who oppressed me the most during my time, there was another black woman. I remember being a student and not having textbooks. And um, I remember I had a bursary from, from that firm at the time. And I, there, was, there was money left over. I remember asking for that money to buy textbooks. And I remember being told that I'm spoiled. Um, I remember being told that um, in her time, she didn't have any bursary. She started working with two pairs of pants. I, I had no idea what that had anything to do <laughs> with me trying to get textbooks. Um, I remember that money rotting at Vitz. It stayed there for five years rather oh, than God. her authorizing it to come to me. So I, I always tell that story because it, it, it really hurts me so much. And you know, a lot of, of companies say that uh, they, they, they embrace values such as diversity, such as transformation. And, and, and it's true, they, they, they do sort of accept different cultures right up until it's time to acknowledge each other's socioeconomic differences. Then all of a yeah. sudden, it's a different story, you know? And mm. yeah, I, I mean, um, to, to come back to, to what you were saying of, of sort of having to censor your voice, um, I remember, um, like I said, my, my, I, had, I was part of a very sort of transformed team, which was very helpful, but that didn't insulate us from the kind of clients that we had, you know, which, which were yeah. white male clients. And 
I still remember being prepped, you know, in a way to be like, oh, you know, um, when these clients come, don't mind them too much. You know, they, they, they may make uh, inappropriate jokes, but, you know, it's, it's, it's water on the duck's back. And I remember being like, what? <laughs> I must sit through inappropriate jokes because I, I don't want to offend the client. Like, what in the world do you mean? Yeah. Um, so so it's, it is, it, it, it's a very tricky one, um, sort of how to navigate those, those kinds of, of situations. And I feel um, much like Kulus uh, has said, there's only so much that you can do at some point before you actually decide, you know what, this is, this is an affront to my dignity and I'm leaving. There's only so much that, that you can uh, sort of try and get to it or so much that you can take before you do leave. And yeah. the thing about, about, about companies is fine. We are saying that, you know, you guys are embracing transformation. You're embracing that, that kind of, of diversity, but what are you really doing for, for the, for the large intake of, because a lot of them will take young black females, you know, um, they'll get their BEE ratings up, but um, in terms of uh, skills and development, you know, what are they doing in, in that? Are you giving those kinds of candidate stretch opportunities? Um, that matters, you know? So you'll yeah. find that even if the intake is there, the retention cannot last because the culture is not built for people like you and me. And that's what often happens. And then it becomes a revolving door. People come in and come out. Um, but really... We, we, we cannot say that we, we embrace uh, diversity and transformation when you need to recognize that as a black woman coming into the workforce, I mean, there was a, 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 the story of the 13 year old girl with uh, the Facebook incident um, who's, I mean, understand that I'm coming into your environment as a, a woman fearing for her life. Are you appreciating that about me when you're saying that you're embracing diversity and our socioeconomic differences? So mm -hmm. I, I think that a lot of, of introspection needs to be done um, by corporates as well um, to, 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 to sort of reflect on how are they living up to, to the values and those principles that they say they are. I hear you. Um, communication experts tell us that when facts don't fit into particular frameworks, then society has a difficult time incorporating these new facts into their way of thinking. So when there's no name for a problem, in Kimberly Crenshaw's words, then you can't see this problem. And when you can't see this problem, then you can't solve it. And Holofelo and Tando speak to this about naming it. Sometimes, you know, when we don't have the vocab, when you don't have the words, when you don't have the names, when you can't identify this problem in a language that your oppressor is understanding, then you, you're prolonging, you know, you're prolonging the potential for it to be um, resolved and this can result in your continued sort of oppression. And I want to ask, you know, develop Acad academia itself is definitely not going to solve everything because you need some sort of action. But action without the groundwork is also just a little bit futile. And at some point, we have to be marrying um, the two, you know? You found a way to marry your activism with practice because you're still a practice attorney, but you do all of this activism in which you hold space. I want you to share some of your experiences of being able to actively in your everyday life be challenging all of this while still maintaining um, a professional career, maybe sharing some boundaries, you know, I feel like as a young person who's getting into the space, I feel like I'm going to be exhausted. Simpio commented here, being an activist on a daily basis, it's depressing, you can't have just your mere existence be a political statement. Sometimes we just want personal fulfillment. We want joy. We want to be happy. We don't want to always be fighting. But at the same time, we do have that moral obligation to be making the spaces better for people that come after us. So please speak to that marrying of your two journeys, but also I think boundaries more than anything so that you're not tiring yourself out in this work. So um, I think... First and foremost, I want to sort of draw parallels between 
um, gender-based violence and racism. I think it is at the end of the day, the same demon, um, the, the, the fight or the war against the two is almost, you know, the same intensity. And what I said maybe a week ago was that it's so burdensome that it's always victims of gender-based violence who then have to take to the streets and march and then have to take to the streets and, 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 and petition and, yeah. and, constantly confront the government or confront law enforcement to do something about gender-based violence. And in the same breath, it's so exhausting that the victims of racism, i.e. black women specifically in corporate, also then have to be activists. When do we just get to enjoy our positions? When will we just have a peaceful day where we are celebrated for the work that we do and not celebrated because, um, like Mpo said, you have to, uh, you, you know, it's a checklist, a BE checklist. And for me, the, the way I, I've managed to, you know, almost balance the two, firstly, I, I really believe that I am in a position of privilege. I do not have to ask to anybody, but in being in that position of privilege where I'm no longer in, in corporate South Africa, I do understand that there are institutionalized systems in place that will always put me on a back foot anyway. So in being my own brand, there's still a, 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 a level of responsibility that I have towards the system, if I can put it that way. I cannot just always speak, um, speak my mind because I need to be careful as to not to step on people's toes. I cannot always speak my mind. For example, um, if, if, if I have grievances with a, a specific bank and that bank is very, very likely to be my client, I can't always be as expressive, right? Um, so there are boundaries that I have to abide by, even though I do not hold myself accountable or I'm not accountable to an employer. Yeah. It's very exhausting, um, like I said, being, being it's, it's exhausting being a, a, a black woman. I think there was a, there was a post going around that said, um, being, being a black woman is like being black twice. Yeah. We constantly have, you know, um, of white oppression on our necks as women and that's that that is exhausting in itself it's exhausting that when you wake up you need to figure out a way to navigate in 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 a white dominated world it's exhausting that when you go to sleep you're scared that tomorrow you're going to face the same challenges yeah i, I, the thing I, is, I don't even know if there is a balance Oh, that's a difficult one. Here I am hoping, you know, there's some cheat sheet. Um, but I absolutely hear you because in as much as allyship, we have allyship with white women in that they relate to the struggles of being women. At the end of the day, they have white privilege. Mm. Even I, I say our men, even black men, um, in as much as we can form allyship with them in that you know, we're all black, they have male privilege. We are the ones that actually have to form a sisterhood. And it's so disheartening that we've all had some sort of connection um, or some sort of experience with um, black women being the ones perpetuating um, our oppression. I think I want to open a round of questions for anybody who's within... I think you can raise your hand. And while while we wait for questions, it. I think while we wait for questions, just to add on to what you've said about privilege, um, the most recent guest on the podcast this week's guest, Peel, made a comment that um, that you know there was there was there was a story that Marilyn Monroe didn't want to be in a certain bar unless Nina Simone would be allowed in to sing. And being yes. in a position of privilege, yeah. you actually have the responsibility to speak out against injustices. You know, if you're a black uh, senior associate and you see a black candidate being treated, you do have that responsibility to speak out against it because you're in a position of privilege. If you're a black female director and you see that there's an injustice against a candidate attorney, you already have that voice. You already have that influence as a director. You have to speak out against it and you don't get to speak out against it, you know, in secret. I'm saying if, 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 if the black candidate attorney is going to be mistreated at a meeting, you don't get to wait until after the meeting to tell the other white director that I don't think you should have handled it in this, man in this manner. Call it out for what it is in that very meeting. Mm. And that is not the way to address 
um, a black person in this meeting. I am offended. You must say, I, as a director, I am offended that you'd treat a fellow colleague in this manner. And you have to call it out for what it is. Because most of the time, we don't hold white people accountable. We want to sort of, um, you know, call them out in private. We don't, we don't, they don't get to be racist in public and then be called out in private. Let's call them out in the platform that they made their racist remarks. Even if it is, um, you know, even if you're a senior associate and that was a director, you get to then say in that specific meeting, I don't like the way you've handled this. You know, call it out for what it is. I'm telling you, I really believe that, um, you know, even as a person, when someone calls you out, there's a level of embarrassment and you say, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of that. So when we start embarrassing black, white people and calling out the racism for what it is, I think there will start being some sort of progress, some sort of um, level of accountability. Yeah. Siadimo. Hello. Yeah. I think she's getting some questions ready, Tando. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, mm. I noted Balexa and Sibedi. I think they can um, unmute themselves and just um, ask their questions. I do need to note, I've had load shedding since when I said my video can't join. Then we had load shedding. I've been in the dark since. And ESCOM network okay. affects um, my connectivity. So please pardon my delay. Um, can we get Balisa first and then Tibedi? I don't know if um, Debella, you want to create a new link because I'm getting a notification that um, we're being kicked out of the session as well. I don't know. Does it does will that will that same link let us back in? Or I have to create a new one completely. Does anyone know? Can, you can use the old link, Debella. So everyone must just rejoin on 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 the old link. Okay, the, the, link, okay. the link is on the is on the, my bio on Instagram. So if it does kick us out, please just click on the same link um, uh, on the bio on Instagram and then come back into it. Perfect. Okay, we'll take Balas's question and then Tibedi's question and then we'll see well, who answers. Um, thank, thank you, Siadima. Um, and thank you to everyone for sharing your stories. Um, my question is kind of related to, to, or has to do with, you know, the spaces that we create for, for black women in the workplace. Hearing all your stories, no, nothing sounds unfamiliar. Like we've all been there, we're all going through it. And as sad as it is for me to admit, chances are my daughter's gonna go through it and probably even her daughter. And I don't know if you guys saw the BET Awards, whether it was last year or the year before, where in Tyler Perry's speech, I think it was, where he was talking about, you know, while everyone else is busy trying to get a seat at the table, I'm going to create my own table and, and, and so on. So without necessarily getting into the, the practicalities of how doable it is, um, my question to the speakers is, do you think we should be focusing our energies on rather creating spaces that like firms that are black women owned and black women run? Because the constant battle of, of being in white corporate and, and trying to be heard and trying to, there's only ever like one, two, three of us at a time doing it. You know, I'm at a firm in Cape Town where out of a hundred plus lawyers, there's all of five African people. So when we speak about an issue, the majority just doesn't get it. it it's, and, and trying to yeah. get, and take it seriously as such a process and like Cynthia rightly said it is very exhausting to constantly be the pioneer for change lockdown is probably the the most comfortable I've ever felt throughout my professional career because it's the first time where I'm working and all I have to do is think about my work I'm not in the office I'm not confronted with racism every day I'm not dealing with all these microaggressions when I have to draft something or put something together that's all I have to think about and not all these other issues that I deal with on the daily so with that in mind would it just not be better for us to focus our energies on creating black spaces for black people than trying to make white people invite us into theirs? So, I think that's okay. a difficult one. So, if, 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 if creating black owned um, things can't be the solution, that can't be the solution because I feel that in doing that, we're not even confronting the issue for what it is. We're sort of running away. We're sort of still making it comfortable for white people to, to dominate spaces because that's exactly what they'll do. 
that's exactly what they'll do. If we keep making it comfortable and, and creating our own spaces instead of confronting the demon for what it is, then I don't think that that's transformation. For example, um, leaving, mm. leaving a white-owned firm and, and, and starting a black-owned firm where it's just black people isn't isn't really helping the transformation battle. Mm. We just now what what we now have is just a a, a full black owned law firm, but there's it does nothing for transformation. We want to transform Absolutely. the spaces that mm. we're already in. What we're trying to do is transform the spaces we're already in. We can't all go start a standard bank. We can't all go start an FNB. We can't all go start a ENS. We need to transform the spaces that exist. Debello, can I Debello. can I chip in? I'm mm. sorry, can I just chip in for the last two minutes? Um, so here's the problem I have with, with legal minds. I I and I'm gonna be very blunt about it. I just find people uh of with legal minds to be very narrow-minded. And if you look at the contribution to our society to date, you have people who have qualifications that make them tremendously knowledgeable tremendously powerful but i hardly know of very many lawyers or legal minds who are doing much transformation in society at large you know we're speaking about dismantling um white heteropatriarchy whiteness and 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 uh, misogyny misogyny or misogynoir and yet um i don't see very many lawyers who are black conscious like who say that i I, I am a, I am a moving forward, Steve Biko's ideology of radical b- black love, and um, you know the b- a black liberation in every space. I hardly see lawyers and legal minds or academics who can pronounce proudly that they are feminists and who implant all of these ideologies in everything that they do. So while I think that. I, I definitely think that we should we should be leading and owning and even creating spaces if we need to, but all of that is useless if it is not underpinned by the correct ideology. That's why we have, for example, a parliament with 50% women, but we still have a, an anti-woman society because we think that it's just about numbers. It's just about, oh, what, what if women went and created a space? If women go and create the space, but these women are still brainwashed by the ideology that, uh, that um, oppressed them, then it, it, it is meaningless. The starting point is ideology. What is your ideology? And standing firm in that ideology of intersectional feminism and of radical black consciousness, period. Sure, agreed. Um, I don't know if we should all just migrate on this new link. Let's do so. And then um, we'll take Mbali and Nell's questions. They've got their hands up. Let's migrate. and then I we'll... apologize. So, sorry, where do we find the link again? It's in the chat. On... I put it um, in the chat.